Bill and Steven and I'm the CEO of 118 Group. In these videos, I'm trying to give you as much information and insight as I can in 10 minutes or less. These slides aren't pretty, they're not well designed, they, are, they have minimal text, they're straight to the point, um, and my goal is to give you just what you need quickly diving right in. So uh, this video is all about website accessibility, what it is, um, why it matters, you know how it affects your website and what you can do about it. Uh, to start, I wanna make it clear that we are not attorneys and uh, digital accessibility has a large legal angle and uh, implications for um, your legal team if you have one. So that's a conversation that you need to have with them if you're, uh, if you're concerned about that. And we'll get into more of those details. But as I mentioned, the high level overview, what is digital accessibility? Why does it matter? How does it affect my website, your website, and what should I do You know, from your perspective? So what is digital accessibility? Georgetown Law says that digital accessibility refers to the inclusive practice of removing barriers that prevent interaction with or access to websites, digital tools, and technologies by people with disabilities. Um, so your website is the key here. Um, inclusive practice of removing barriers that prevent interaction with or access to your website. Um, Digital accessibility is otherwise referred to as ADA compliance. You might be seeing that uh, in your travels. ADA represents the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, which made it illegal to discriminate against people with disabilities in commercial facilities, among other things. Examples, uh, you needed ramps. When, when ADA came out for, um, you know, in, in its first iteration, uh, things like ramps for building entrances, buttons for automatic doors, and braille on signage. Um, again, you, it was illegal to uh, discriminate based on disability, so removing barriers to access is really the key uh, lens with which to view this. Your website equals a version of your commercial facility. Uh, in, in, and again, as I mentioned, we're not attorneys, but from what we've seen, the ADA has been interpreted in certain major court cases to extend an entity's responsibility for accessibility compliance to its digital facilities, its website as well. Um, and again, this is the legal angle, like, angle here. Uh, companies such as Target, Netflix, and Winn-Dixie have been hit by major suits as a result of this extension from the, the, the physical ADA requirements to a digital ADA compliance. This has evolved as websites become more integral to um, a, a, a customer or client's ability to engage with a brand as more of the brand's processes or offerings move online. So this is kind of a key tie that's been made is the website and the, the commercial physical representation piece. Um, what does it mean to be compliant, ADA compliance? Uh, uh, the, there are no hard and fast standards for what deems a website compliant in a court of law. Accessibility has been a spectrum and is typically taken on a case-by-case -case basis. That being said, there is a set of criteria called the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines or WCAG for short. And this is essentially a list of 78 criterion that digital experiences must meet in order to be deemed accessible. What that looks like, so here we have, um, a high level overview of it, it, basically this is the WCAG website on the left hand side you'll see a list of all the criterion running down uh, or criteria depending on how you would like to approach that running down the left hand side um, and as you can see there's a lot of things to cover but it is grouped it's grouped by perceivable operable uh, understandable and robust and so that represents poor and it's how they organize these criteria Oper so perceivable re relates to um, a lot of things like use of color uh, contrast text sizing um, you know non-text content so um, we're talking about for example um, alternative text for images if people can't see the image uh, be, for, for visual, because of visual impairments, they should still be able to understand what the visual represents. Uh, you know, color contrast on pages so that people with, uh, who are hard of sight can see text even if it's kind of over on top of a color. Um, you know, info and relationships, there should be 
clear structure um, in terms of what what information relates to other information and that can be conveyed in the form of sizing or spacing or uh, connection. Um, so there's, there's a lot of criteria here. Operable relates to how users interact with any sort of, um, interact with any of the, the links on the site through keyboard navigation or any of the uh, other interactions that happen on the site like video, animation, um, and, and, and inputs, forms, all that stuff. Any, anything that's an interaction. Understandable, this relates to uh, the use of language, the use of words, abbreviations, uh, pronunciation, and then robust. Um, this relates to um, how, how well this, uh, you know, your website might interact with uh, assistive technologies, which we can talk about. So um, those are the criteria and um, as you can see, there's a lot of them. So um, it's no joke when we talk about digital accessibility. Um, and this is really the gold standard for evaluating how accessible a website is, is typically how many of this criteria it, it, can, it can check off. And again, it's a spectrum. It's not, you're not completely unaccessible if you check off 77 of them. Um, you know, you, you're, you fall on a scale somewhere there. So in all digital tool or, or websites or digital applications or whatever, fall somewhere on that accessibility spectrum. Why does it matter? Well, uh, there's a couple of reasons. One, it's ethical in the sense that uh, why does digital accessibility matter? Well, eth you know, the first reason is it's ethical. We should all want to live in a world where more people are able to access goods services and information via digital channels um, and we all might need help with this at some point right we we don't we don't want a world in which um, certain segments of the population are unable to access things or, or interact with things especially as we understand how important the internet and digital tools are for us to learn and develop and grow at, in this day and age to just you know, uh, to kind of doom a certain segment of the population of that because we don't want to approach things with accessibility in mind is, is in our eyes, um, unethical. So that's number one, it's, it's, it's ethical to design, to, to, to build accessible solutions. Two, it's profitable. So um, given that 26% of Americans have some types of disability uh, and many of those are related to mobility, visual hearing impairments, it makes sense to build things they can engage with, right? When else would you ever just decide the 26% of your audience uh, doesn't matter, right? Like you, you just, that just wouldn't be a smart business move in any case. So two, it's profitable. Three, it's better in the sense that um, much of what the WCAG, which was that long list of 78 guidelines or criteria uh, that make up the WCAG guidelines, a lot of the stuff that it recommends is already best practice when it comes to user experience and design principles. Though, you know, those criteria um, are essentially um, what has been deemed the, the most intuitive and the easiest to use um, by, you know, through research. And so that means, you know, we all want websites that are intuitive and easy to use and accessible for all of our users so they can engage with, our, you know, what we're offering um, easily. So, you know, we're removing any barrier uh, for anybody when we when you when we move towards an accessible design, and you know Google, for example, a search engine that ranks websites for uh, different keywords, they leverage a lot of those same guidelines and those same criteria when deciding the you know how how well a website is built and helping to rank and determine where those websites fall. So it's good in the sense that it's probably better for your users, anyways. Uh, and two, um, it makes your website stand out when it comes to search results. So, um, so that's number three. That's kind of a combination of it's better and it's more profitable. So, um, how does it affect my website? You know, specifically. Well, um, there's really, you know, it, this is kind of a, a simplification, but that it works for the purpose of this of this video. Um, there's really, you know, you can put, kind of draw a line and put the impacts into two different buckets. You have visible versus non-visible impacts. So in terms of how, if you decided today, you wanna to make your website more accessible than it has been, um, the, the visible impact that will have on your site, the stuff you could see, for example, you're, you know, there's gonna be changes probably to your colors to ensure that there's proper contrast, 
between uh, text and backgrounds uh, or, or headings and backgrounds. Um, your fonts, you might have illegible fonts or your fonts might be too small or too, or too thin or those colors might need to change. Images, uh, you would need to consider what images on your website convey important information and you would need to make sure that those images, uh, one, are re readable and two, have alternative text. Um, the, the, the focus of the stuff you can see here is really just the contrast of the, of the images and how, and how they display the information you're displaying. Animations, um, you, know, you'll, you, you, know, you might have to leverage, you have to get creative with your, your use of animations and dynamic uh, features because some of these animations can create um, visual issues for people like parallax, it can create nausea, dizziness. Um, you, wanna, you need to be careful about the, the animations you're including and your content structure because again, you need to have a logical relationship between items uh, which falls into that readable um, and perceivable category. So that means essentially you need to be more considerate about um, what's a heading, what's a subheading, what is, you know, what are the, what are the, you know, eight, the following headings that um, break up this content? How do you break up a big block of content that's, uh, that's disorganized? How do you organize it into separate sections that have uh, cohesive points? Um, again, to make it more legible, which is obviously just better in general for your users is a more legible content structure. Um, stuff you can't see that will have an impact. Um, and this is, um, a lot, you know, is kind of the bulk of it. Um, it, it. Well, that's not necessarily true, but it can be the bulk of it is um, stuff that's happening to the code on the site. So um, a big thing is code labels. They're called ARIA tags. And basically uh, your developer needs to label certain parts of your website um, correctly so that um, screen readers, for example, can uh, understand where they're at in the site by because the screen reader just looks at your code um, and it'll tell the user based on the code what they're see what is being presented and, and where it's being presented and how they can navigate through it so that the code needs to be marked up correctly um, you need to have alternative text on all of your images that display uh, useful information uh, and you there's other assistive tech stuff that your code needs to be modified for. So uh, examples of like fully accessible websites that you know you might be able to tell a bit of a difference. This is the W3C, which is the people that put together this, uh, the, the, the guidelines. You know, they decided we'll keep it very simple. There's very little color um, and very little flash here, right? There's, there, it's very straightforward. And I'm sure if you looked at the code, it would all be very easy to navigate. Um, for example, you see how I'm tabbing through, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of simulating the use of a, of a, a screen reader and I'm tabbing through the content, uh, to see where I am uh, on the page and to navigate to different areas of the site. Um, that's, that's kind of an example of some stuff you might see if you were, if you were going to retool your site for accessibility. Another kind of good one is, is the digital.gov. Um, they focus, you know, they keep, they still keep it simple where it's, uh, it's not like you have a lot of stuff happening here. You have uh, easy to read text with font sizes, boldness, color, um, and you know, not too much going on. And again, I'm sure you'll see uh, easy ways to navigate through some of these different areas. If you were a user who needed, um, needed to use uh, some sort of assistive technology. So, uh, and then you might notice a lot of like town websites, municipal websites will have that accessibility kind of design in, you know, in place. What should my organization do about it? Again, emphasizing we're not attorneys. So, uh, and you'll, you'll see why that matters in the next slide. But um, ultimately you need to ask yourself why you're approaching the accessibility uh, focus anyways. Um, like what's, What's driving this focus on accessibility? Let me move myself so you can read. So um, there's basically, as, we, as far as we see it, there's two different roads. You have the ethical concern road and you have the legal concern road. The ethical concern is my organization is interested in accessibility because we want to ensure that we are reaching the widest possible audience because that's what we believe is right. The legal concern is 
you know, my organization is interested in accessibility because we are legally liable to lawsuits and it's in our best interest financially to achieve compliance. These two different roads have two different roadmaps essentially for, um, you know, and, you know, action items to deal with because um, the legal concern, if you're, you know, that requires, um, you know, it's obviously going to be a different approach than just trying to put your best foot forward and do the right thing. And so, uh, what does that look like? Get myself back over here. Um, so, if your if your motivation comes from a legal liability concern, the best way to protect yourself, if you're looking at that protection motivation, is to determine does it demonstrate a commitment to pursuing the WCAG criteria. Uh, basically, you want to show uh, to users and any sort of potential um, anybody filing potential lawsuits or interested in, in filing lawsuits um, you want to demonstrate a commitment to pursuing the WCAG criteria um, this can be done by hiring an outside party to perform a, a full audit and remediation of your site um, and basically the audit you, you'll, you'll hire a team who specializes in accessibility who has you know certifications and a real pedigree of working with uh, accessibility development because it's a different beast than everything else. Um, they'll come in, they'll have their team run really thorough audits against all of those criteria using assistive technologies um, and, and leveraging their, 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 their kind of niche expertise. They'll do the audit and they'll, you'll set up a plan for fixing all the problems that are on your site. So that's typically uh, the most comprehensive solution. Um, and this outside party typically will provide you with some documentation that helps prevent and fight litigation because again, they're demonstrating that you are pursuing the WCAG criteria um, and you are trying to, you're demonstrating a commitment to it. So um, the only thing about this avenue is these audits and remediations are typically expensive. They're, it's it's time consuming, it's a high skill, it's, it requires a deep knowledge and a high skill level to perform and remediate, it takes time um, and it's tricky to do. So all those things lead to um, those three dollar signs there. That's why typically the people we see come from this legal protection perspective have had conversations with their attorneys or have had conversations with um, uh, potential users who are, you know are complaining or discussing legal action and they've decided that the audit and remediation is still cheaper than leaving yourself liable to potential lawsuits or settlements later so it's typically a, a, a profit and loss kind of decision there so um, so that's the legal concern if you're coming from the ethical concern if your motivation is more focused around doing the right thing you should just talk, start talking to your current web team. Uh, it's likely that until you express this as a major focus, they likely won't make it a big consideration uh, because typically accessible design requires more time, it requires more thought, and typically it requires, like we showed earlier, con you know, concessions on your design. You, you, you know, they might have to tell you mo no more when it comes to the things you wanna do because A, it wouldn't be accessible, or B, to make it accessible would be cost prohibitive. So they are likely not wanting to push all those costs on you, and until you emphasize its importance, uh, they probably uh, aren't considering that when, you know, when putting things together for your team. So um, I'd say you, for an ethical concern, you start here and you see what they offer, you see what their skills are with this, see their knowledge is with this currently, um, and you start that conversation so that they can understand this is important to them. We should start planning this and budgeting for this uh, when they start asking us for, 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 for future work. Um, a quick note of caution, many brands have attempted to address the accessibility concern on their website with these simple overlays or add-ons or plugins or softwares that basically you just you know click, turn on, and they claim to kind of you know, make your website more accessible. Um, but studies have shown that you know these very same technologies actually can further interfere with the accessibility of the site by adding another layer of code that can um, can just mess up the, the the experience. So 
The truth is there's no easy way out. It takes a thoughtful ground up approach to design and develop with accessibility in mind. Um, so you need to start by asking yourself, why do I want to do it? Uh, and what resources do I have at my disposal to start focusing on it? So, um, so that's it. Try to keep it quick. Again, not pretty, uh, but it works. If you have questions, feel free to email me, dylan at 118group.com. And um, have a great day.